So I would like to invite Dr. Todd Maxson from the University of Arkansas back to the podium. He will be speaking to us about pediatric trauma. Why are we, why are we scanning that child? Thanks again for the privilege of the podium. I'll give a little shout out to Terry and Ron and my friends from the University of Arkansas who are watching uh, remotely today. So thanks for allowing us to do this. I, I'm curious how you translated nuke them in Spanish. I didn't know how that, how that played over. Did David take the clicker? No, I left it right up there for you. Right there, thanks. I scan for four reasons. <laughs> I scan because it's necessary. Sometimes. I scan because I don't know any better. I scan because I think I'm protecting myself from liability to find all the injuries. And I scan because I don't want to get out of bed. Those are the four reasons. Three of those are terrible. Terrible. Let's talk about how we can reduce those. I saw my first CT scan in 1985. It was it was looked like a snowstorm in Dakota. It looked like the radar. It was terrible. Uh, and in the 80s, you know, about three, four, five million scans a year being done. In 2006, 22 times that, and the rate's going up 8 percent a year. This technology is here. It's getting more and more prevalent. Uh, it will continue to do so. In 1980s. Most of our radiation that we received was from the environment, and I'll talk about that. In 2006, 2012, most of our radiation is from medical sources, primarily from CT scanning. That number is going up, and the number of people that get what's considered a high dose or a high absorption of radiation, fit greater than 50 millisieverts a year, is going up at an astronomic rate. And don't think addressing maybe first the I think I'm covering my liability. The fact that the lay press has not picked this up and if the lay press, the Washington Post, the New York Times is picking up the fact that we are overusing CT scanning and CT scanning is causing cancer, the lawyers cannot be far behind. There is a consequence to it and I'll talk about the flaws in this data but it is believed that some number of abdominal CT scans, chest CT scans, pelvic CT scans, spine CT scans are going to lead to a cancer. So if I cover my posterior by doing 300 scans over my year, over my time, that really after looking at it and anal analyzing them were not necessary, I have caused one child a cancer. So I, I, need, to, I need to be careful and thoughtful about that. So I may have I may have decreased my liability in the short term, but I've probably bought it back in the long term. Two percent of our cancers at some point are estimated that they will come from CT scanning alone. Understand just for a second the pathophysiology of ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation uh, uh, lets loose free electrons. The free electrons turn, uh, inj create free radicals. Free radicals injure my DNA. My DNA replicates over time, and at some point that replication is a missense and can lead to a cancer. Now, I'm a fat 53-year-old guy, so I'm not going to live that much longer, right? I can replicate my bad DNA for a few more years and it probably won't turn into anything significant. But those babies that I showed you in my last talk should live 90 or 100 years. As they replicate for the next 90 or 100 years, their chances of developing a cancer at some point in their life are a magnitude different than mine. So a completely different discussion talking about the fat 50-year-old guy who comes in crashing his motorcycle and I'm going to scan him head to toe to miss anything versus that 18-month-old that I'm going to scan because I don't want to miss anything. Very different relationship there. Now again, this methodology all comes from the beer uh, project which looked at ionizing radiation from the atomic blast and you could argue well those are different types of ionizing radiation but the pathophysiology of how it damages DNA is the same. The numbers you can argue with, the, the, the pathophysiology that I've uh, described there is the same. So there's going to be a lag time. The younger you are, the more susceptible. The thinner you are, 
the more susceptible. The more biologic active the tissue is that's being radiated, the more susceptible. So females are more susceptible, thin kids are more susceptible, the thymus, the thyroid, the eyes, uh, the breast, much more susceptible than brain and bones. So to think, I'm just going to go ahead and get the CT of the neck, because I've already gotten the head and the chest, and it's not that much more, has a cost to it, has a biologic cost to it that you should take into account when you decide. I'm just going to go ahead and get it because it makes me feel better about all that. Uh, the risk of cancer goes up linear linearly with the amount of radiation that you get. Now there's probably a break point at about 50 millisieverts or absorbed radiation, but there is no such thing as a safe dose of radiation. Um, we wear the badges in the operating room, we measure our, our, our doses, but the truth is is that every bit that we get increases our lifetime cumulative amount and probably increases our risk. So there is a factor of total exposure, there is a factor of exposure over short periods of time, and certainly the younger you are, the more chance you're going to build that up. And it's important to, important to know that you're going to build that up, because just look at this, just look at living. Right? So average from the environment, I'm going to pick up about three millisieverts a year. If I fly home today, I'm going to pick up about a quarter. If I live in Denver, I'm going to pick up a quarter. What I find fun about this slide is that my mother told me as I was growing up, sit back from the television because I was going to die of radiation from the television. She was wrong, but her food actually was killing me. So that's, I've, I've reminded her of that a couple of times. And we're really not talking about playing films, although, again, every little bit matters and the cumulative about, uh, uh, matters, but there is a huge difference, magnitudes of difference between playing films and diagnostic studies and axial scanning from CT. So I want you to think about this when we talk about can we get the data any other way. We can use radiation, but it is really the axial scanning that really ends up causing the problem. And again, the, the kids, because they're thin, because they're young, they absorb more of the, of the radiation, and the consequence is higher for the same body part uh, examined. So if you want to translate that into the beer study and sort of make an analysis there. The 80-year-old guy, the chance of him developing a cancer is low. The fat 50-year-old trauma surgeon, the chance is fairly low. But that 20-year-old female, it gets much higher. That infant, it gets astronomically high. So there's a cost. I just want to point out that there's a cost. Now here's what we typically do. The kid comes in the shock room. We get three films in the shock room because that's what we're taught to do. And then they go get a head scan and an abdomen and pelvis scan, a chest scan. And we're just going to go ahead and get the chest and neck because we're there and it's almost that. We can reconstruct the spine. We say those things to ourselves. And then the next day, I know you don't have to, but let's just repeat the scans. There was a little bit of blood there on this little subarachnoid blood. I'm going to repeat a chest film just to make sure the tube's in place. So in the first 12 hours now, I've taken this kid and I've given him some 20, 25 millisieverts of radiation exposure. And if you look at studies done at big trauma centers, the median patient that comes in the shock room, the median level one trauma patient here receives almost 40 millisieverts. I told you that 50 millisieverts puts you in a very high risk category and there's a big break point in the risk of cancer at about 50 and the average trauma patient is getting 40 or the equivalent of about a thousand chest x-rays. So it's not really about the chest x-rays, it's about the axial scanning. And this is essentially what we're doing. So I scan variably. So let's take the same patient. The same patient is in two different car wrecks. One car wreck, I'm at a freestanding children's hospital. We see one high level activation a day. We've got an army of people. We're going to put that kid in because they've got a femur fracture. We're going to watch them closely. And as you just heard from David, I can intervene if they develop symptoms and not cause them any increased morbidity or mortality. So I don't have to do a thing to that kid. I can watch them. I can send my army around, make sure they make rounds every 10 minutes if I need to. And if they develop symptoms, we act and we're not going to hurt anybody. 
versus I'm at a busy trauma center. I'm at Peter Reed's place at Grady, and I got four trauma patients that come in at one time. I'm going straight to the operating room with one. There's three more that are sick. I don't have an army. I don't have people that can check on these kids all night long. I might scan. I might scan. And so I've at least examined the cost and the likelihood of missing an injury or letting an injury go undiagnosed for a period and cause a problem. And I've taken that into consideration as I've decided who I'm going to scan. So I scan variably. I scan out of ignorance. The CT scan of the infant's neck will not clear the neck. So you've done nothing helpful to scan the neck except give a lot of radiation to a developing thyroid and thymus for somebody in whom it has no benefit. The clearance of the pediatric C-spine is a clinical diagnosis first and or an MRI diagnosis next. And so you're not going to clear it. So getting that scan helped the child none. You, increased, you incurred a cost for no benefit in this kid. I scan out of ignorance. I scan sometimes because I don't really understand the benefit or the opportunities for alternate methodology there. I can use plain films. I can use ultrasound. David just showed us beautiful pictures of ultrasounding the spleen and the splenic vessels uh, with an ultrasound. And at my places, we use more and more and more ultrasound. We get better and better and better at it. And I have more confidence in the output of that data as I get it. We can use dirty MRI uh, for quick head scans. Uh, and we can use labs, as I talked about in my last uh, my last discussion uh, to help predict who does and doesn't have an intra-abdominal injury and scan more precisely if necessary. So there's a lot of adjuncts that I can use if I'm willing to understand the positive predictive value of those and weigh that against the cost of the ionizing radiation. So I ask myself a lot, um, is this scan going to change my management? If it's not, if I'm at an outside hospital and I'm going to send that pediatric patient regardless and I don't have surgical backup to operate if necessary, or I'm not going to send the kid home based on the CT scan, I'm going to transfer them regardless, then let's don't scan. Let's don't scan. So is it going to change my management, yes or no? And if it's not, then absolutely we don't need that scan. Is CT by far the more superior way to get the data that I need. I need to know, I need data. The AST and ALT were elevated. I need to understand about the liver. Um, there's several patients. I need to know it. I'm going to go ahead and scan. It's a little bit elevated. There's no other injuries. I'm going to put the kid in anyway and watch them because of other things that are going on. I can watch that kid. Not really that important. So I'm not going to scan. And can I perform, lastly, can I perform a CT scan with the lowest possible radiation cost? available, and I'll talk a little bit about that. There are clinical decision rules. Nate Kupperman has really done a very good job for us in the United States, along with Fred Rivara, at giving us a couple of decision tools for the emergency medicine doc to originally decide if you're low risk, low uh, sort of uh, low level of suspicion based on physical examination, there are kids in whom you, you don't have to scan. So it gives us a little, culp a little uh, deflection for our liability there. There are rules out there that say, I didn't have to scan. The, the literature says I don't have to scan that kid's head. There's literature now that says you don't have to repeat scans on kids' heads. There's now decision tools from the same group that talk about when and how to scan uh, the abdomen for low risk injuries. And so you have some backup to say there really is some support. There's a reason not to scan everybody and now there's some support in the literature that says I didn't have to scan that person. But you gotta, you gotta look at it. Uh, and then, and we've known this for some time, there's good data about who needs it. Does everybody need a shock room chest x-ray? No, not in the pediatric patient population. Does everybody need a pelvic x-ray in the shock room? Absolutely not. There's not a four-year-old in the world that I can't tell you by physical examination whether or not their pelvis is unstable. And if I find it, I'm going to write it up anyway. It really doesn't happen much. But I can figure that out on physical exam. So the good physical exam always trumps it in, in most pediatric patients. Our experience in our acute care surgical world is really around appendicitis and there's no doubt, there's no doubt that other modalities can be 
helpful. So I scan sometime out of laziness because the truth is the number one modality for figuring out if a patient's got appendicitis is my hands uh, laid on the patient's abdomen. That has the highest sensitivity and specificity. If I want to up that, ultrasound can be as good as CT. And in the adolescent female who's, who's menstruating, yes, a CT can help break the tie if it's equivocal. And we do them. We do them all the time. I'm not anti-scan, but at least I try to say, I don't believe I can get the data another way accurately. And so I'm going to get that to up the odds. And in today's world, the, the a, a negative laparoscopy uh, is really not the worst thing in the world. We talked about the labs earlier. They've really got good utility, and I think you need to take these back, look at this literature, and decide for yourself at your institution what your threshold is for a positive and negative predictive value, and decide. We're going to use 10 red cells per high power field, 50 red cells per high power field, AST and ALT at 200 or 250, and if above that, we're going to scan. Anything that you do, any of those decision rules you put in place will decrease unnecessary scans and be of benefit and help guide, help guide it, but you've got to disseminate them widely and use them. Can I do it at less cost? If I'm going to scan, so I'm going to scan that adolescent female in whom the, the exam is somewhat equivocal for appendicitis, can I do it at a lower cost? Well, the American College of Radiology is really helping us with this. They're laying some standards around how you scan, what protocols, what the machine should look like. They're discussing with CMS about paying only for uh, programs that have high quality uh, interventions in place that limit the amount of radiation uh, from their machines that do, uh, that do some of that work. I'll show you this. this is, these are two slides of the exact same cut. So this is a beautiful film. Good grief. If I was looking for a recurrent cancer, this is the kind of film I'd want to have, right? Look at the millisieverts of the absorbed radiation, 500, almost 400 millisieverts of absorbed radiation from this. This scan looks dirty. It looks a little dirty, right? I mean, it's not so clean. The edges aren't quite so sharp. I wouldn't want this scan for my recurrent cancer. But I can absolutely tell for trauma whether or not there's an injury, where it is, whether I need to do something. This is perfectly adequate, and our radiologists can read this and look at the millisieverts. It's about a tenth of what that other one was. So I can get the data at a tenth of the cost. That's the way I begin to think about it. Repeat head scanning. Again, I, the kid had a little bit of a subarachnoid blood. Good decision rules now that said just because we did it yesterday and the kid looks fine today, we don't have to repeat it today. There's really good data that gives us some protection there. So my, rec my recommendations to you are this. Understand first that there is a cost to ionizing radiation. Understand sort of what that cost is, and if you understand the pathophysiology of it a little bit, you can help apply it a little bit better. So the fat 50-year-old trauma surgeon on a motorcycle, you know, you got one algorithm for. The skinny 5-year-old uh, that you're thinking about scanning the chest and neck, you, gotta, you, you, you now have a different basis from which to begin to look at that. Incur the cost when it will change the management at your place. If, it, if you're going to transfer that kid and it's not going to change the management regardless, don't get it at your place. If you're not going to change the management, don't get it. Implement rules that help us practice in an evidence-based way and cover us from a little bit of liability when we choose not to scan. Those make good sense to me. Utilize scanning when it's the best method. Learn to utilize MRI ultrasound, labs, physical examination to decrease the amount of scanning that we need to do. Scan only the desired. I, I really sort of bristle at, I'm going to just go ahead and get the neck because it will complete the whole spine. I don't need the neck. I need to actually shield the thyroid and the breast and the thymus in this developing uh, female. And then limit the, radio the radiation. Go to your radiology radiologist and technologist and ask if they have an image gently protocol and if they're imaging at the lowest acceptable radiation to get the data, um, to get the data and decrease the cost. Again, I really do appreciate you focusing a little bit on the pediatric patient. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks.